Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Joe Francis Penn. And in today's show, I'm talking about my thoughts on travelling to the USA again post pandemic and the differences I noticed between the US and the UK cultures. Now, I travelled to Phoenix, Arizona, USA, from the UK for a week in early May 2022 for a business conference on the creator economy. It was my first trip to the USA since restrictions have eased post pandemic. COVID hasn't gone away, but it's certainly more manageable, at least as I record this a month later in early June 2022. I have been on one other trip since restrictions eased to New Zealand to visit family in November 2021. That was a far more significant journey in terms of travel time. It takes a long time to get there. And we spent 10 days in quarantine and then we couldn't do much because of COVID restrictions. It was for family reasons to a country I lived in for years and I'm a citizen of. So I'm not actually counting that trip as travel at all. So this trip to the USA was kind of my first significant trip, basically. Now, the USA is very different to the UK, perhaps even more so than I remembered since I've been away so long. And Arizona has a very different climate. So I wanted to record this episode while it's all still fresh in my mind. So first, some context and my history with the USA. So I've been travelling to the USA since the early 1990s when my mum moved to Oregon and then to San Diego, although she later moved to New Zealand to be closer to me in the mid-2000s. So outside of those personal trips, I've mainly visited for work and conferences and blended those work trips with other book research things and fun. I've been to New York City, Philadelphia, Chicago, Charleston and Savannah, St. Petersburg, Florida, New Orleans or New Orleans, as we say over here, Austin, Denver, Tucson, Phoenix, Las Vegas, San Diego, San Francisco, Boise and Portland. And I've been to some of those several times. So I I guess I've done quite a lot of the USA. So I feel very at home in the USA and I think a lot of the country and its people. Many of my friends are American. Many of my readers and my audience and community are American. Many of you listening are American. Many of my financial investments are in USA companies and I'm a happy user and a shareholder in some of the biggest American companies. I'm certainly a fan in general, although every country has their problems and their darker side for sure, but I'm not going to go into that today. The USA is also a huge country, I recognise that, and places and the people are so different between the states. And many of the interviews that I've had on the Books and Travel show have gone into some of those different states. So my comments are just a snapshot in time based on one particular place. I just thought it might be interesting to consider how our cultural differences uh, work and as well as how it felt to travel again. And I I just wouldn't have done an episode like this pre-pandemic. It some of this detail seems weird in some ways, but I just felt it was good to snapshot it because things are changing in many ways again. And yeah, I just wanted to talk about it. So first of all, flying again. What was that like? While all pandemic restrictions are over here in the UK, I had to do a COVID test within 24 hours of flying to the USA. Now, that's the most expensive test to get as you have to rush the results. And because you can't check in until it's done and you can't do the paperwork, it really added stress to the pre-flight 
process. Many countries do a 72 hour test, but for the US it was 24 hours. I also had to complete extensive documentation on the Verifly app, which which was new, we hadn't done that before, which included documentation of my vaccinations, test result and other forms along with my ESTA, E-S-T-A, which allows me entry after the US government check up on things. So it's not something you just get automatically, you have to apply, you pay some money and then uh, you get the form once they know a bit more about you and then it's valid for two years. So my last one had um, obviously expired. Now I had actually forgotten how much paperwork traveling can take. I was so relaxed about going to the USA. Uh, I just, I almost didn't check what I needed until, (laughs) not until it was too late, but it was like, oh my goodness, I need to do all these things. So definitely things have increased since the pandemic. And especially if you're not a citizen of the country you're traveling to. So of course, coming back to the UK was super easy. I don't need to do anything. In fact, you don't need to do anything either if you come to the UK. Um, But check what you need before you travel, even if you have traveled to that country before, as it may have changed. Now, it is a 10-hour direct flight from London to Phoenix, Arizona on British Airways. After almost 28 hours to get to New Zealand, 10 hours was a breeze. (laughs) The flight was fine and I just watched movies and read books. There is also now an American Express Centurion Lounge at Heathrow Terminal 3 in London. So I spent time in there after check-in. This is a great thing, believe me, because Terminal 3 is hellish. (laughs) Frequent travellers in the USA will know the variability of these lounges, but this one is a good one, especially in these quiet times before transatlantic travel really picks up again. Now, I actually kept my Amex business credit card specifically because I was waiting for things to get back up again and I wanted to use the lounges and it's been worthwhile in the years I've travelled more regularly to the USA and we also use it to get air points for Emirates, which is our preferred um, carrier to New Zealand. Got to get those air points somehow. So a few people wore masks at the airport, but not many because it's not um, necessary. I say necessary. It's not um, mandatory here in the UK anymore. I did actually wear mine in crowded areas, but it's not a requirement at the airport or on the plane to and from the UK. Uh, I am triple vaxxed and I've had COVID (laughs) and I want to get on with my life. So the prospect of catching it doesn't worry me now. But certainly if you are concerned, then I would still avoid airports for sure. Arriving in Phoenix, Arizona and some immediate differences. So Phoenix is an amazing airport to fly into. The luggage trolleys have America's friendliest airport on them, and it did feel like that. There were no queues, and the customs officer smiled and welcomed me back to the USA. Having flown into JFK, O'Hare, and other big airports many times, where you're treated like a problem, (laughs) it was a dream to arrive in such a lovely, small, welcoming airport. So I can highly recommend Phoenix, Arizona Airport. I got an Uber to the resort hotel and used Uber throughout the trip. And I don't take it for granted. (laughs) I love being able to use the same app as I use here in the UK and also in New Zealand. It has all my payment details, business and personal credit cards, my ratings, saved places, uh, all the safety features. I always ask Uber drivers whether they like the service and pretty much all of them are positive and say it's their job on the side and they like the flexibility of being able to work when they want. So, um, yeah, I, I just love that. Cars are one of the biggest cultural differences I noticed this time, as it is essentially impossible to walk anywhere in Phoenix, Arizona, and in many places in the USA. Not just because of the heat, but mainly the lack of a safe way to walk anywhere. So one morning I needed to get about 15 minutes walk away, and I had to get an Uber because of the highway. It just wasn't safe enough to walk. Also, the cars in the hotel resort car park were enormous. I've seriously, I have never seen cars this big. I mean, I guess we'd call them trucks. They were, but they were in a resort car park. It wasn't like a building site. It was people's normal cars. They were just huge. Some, the height of some of the radiators were as tall as me. These, these were just so big. I have never seen cars and trucks this big. Now, in the UK, we mostly have small cars uh, in the UK and Europe. And big tip, Americans and Australians, If you come to the UK and Europe, well, firstly, you don't normally need a car, but if you do, rent a small one. (laughs) 
<laughs> because we live in smaller spaces and we have much smaller car parks and we often have to park on the roadside uh, and you have to know how to park in the UK. I mean, where I live in Bath, we don't have a car, but it's um, you need to know how to park <laughs> in a tiny space. <laughs> Reverse parking. I'm not sure if they have that in, uh, in uh, US um, driving tests, but we certainly have them here. So we have very walkable cities and use public transport a lot more. So we don't have a car and I walk 8 to 10 kilometres most days. Uh, Just looking at my watch, I've done 16 kilometres today and it's only uh, mid-afternoon. And I do longer when I go for a walk, which is at least 20 kilometres along the canal on a Sunday morning, for example. So walking is just much more normalised, I think. We also have a cafe culture. So you can sit on the streets and uh, and have, you know, coffee. And a lot of the older city centres have pedestrianised spaces. So you can walk into town. There's no cars. You can sit and have a coffee and watch the world go by. And one of my outside, this isn't in a mall. There's no roof. Uh, it's like streets and things. <laughs> And one of my favourite simple pleasures is walking from my house to a cafe in front of the medieval abbey and the Roman baths and sitting there having a coffee, walking home again. And that that's a sort of um, probably an hour walk round trip. So it's not that long. Um, and yeah, it's just lovely. And there are also three wonderful bookstores minutes from each other, which I can walk to. Uh, of course, I have to go in for research purposes. So I sat in the Starbucks near the hotel. And uh, I mean, I'm I'm, and I've seen this in other Starbucks. I often go to Starbucks in America. Um, if there's an a independent coffee shop, I will obviously go there. But in this case, the Starbucks was close to the hotel. And it was an example of the very functional American coffee culture. So I actually went in there to do what I would normally do, which is I have a couple of coffees, I write in my journal, I read, all of that kind of thing. But 99% of the people were in and out, no stopping, many of whom just ordered on the app and that just collected the coffee, popped in and out, and um, a, a long line of the um, uh, sort of car pickup thing, whatever you call that, drive-in, <laughs> the drive-in. Uh, yeah, so it, it's a very, very different culture in that way. Now, I did visit the older part of Phoenix, um, but even the area with a few more shops, and I did go to an independent bookstore, that area was still dominated by roads and cars. It was not pleasant to walk, and it was difficult, basically. Now, of course, I've in the USA, I was able to walk around in New Orleans, which is very European, of course. And uh, But even New York City, San Francisco, in some areas you can walk. Although I was told in one area in San Francisco where my hotel was, they were like, what, what do you mean you want to walk somewhere? I was jet lagged. It was like 3 a.m. They were like, you can't walk around outside at 3 a.m. in San Francisco. <laughs> this, this was in a nice area, basically. So, yeah, it's interesting. But the sense of just casually walking places seems to be missing in certainly in Phoenix. Um, uh, The country seems more designed for cars. It's very similar in Australia, so I'm used to it, but which is Australia is very modelled on the US, whereas New Zealand is more like the UK. Um, Although you still really need a car in New Zealand, things are quite spread apart. So the resort hotel for the conference was on the outskirts of Phoenix and it was pretty much as you'd expect for a nice conference hotel, acceptable options for food. Most people had a car and went off site for dinner. There was a golf course, a spa, water park and the rooms were American sized uh, resort style. Now, it was lovely to see hummingbirds in the bushes around the golf course. And the bird song was beautiful when I tried to walk around in the dawn. I had to walk around in circles quite a lot. Hotel rooms are almost always bigger in the USA and the beds as well. And I know Americans and Australians are often appalled at the tiny hotel rooms in the UK and Europe and our beds are never as big as yours. So um, our double beds are like your single beds. (laughs) I'm always like, why do I need this two super king beds in a hotel room? But uh, yes, on the the personal side, I also find the American toilets weird. (laughs) Ours also are quite different. Um, Let's not get too much into that. But yeah, I was like, oh, why are their toilets so weird? There was a Keurig coffee machine in the room, which I appreciated a lot. But this is another difference to the UK. We have a kettle in the room and some tea bags, but rarely a coffee machine. You'll get sachets of instant coffee and in the more upmarket places, maybe a Nespresso pod machine. In the USA, you get a coffee machine and never a kettle. So I end up having to make my peppermint tea with water heated up through the coffee machine, which makes it taste odd, but I do it anyway. 
So the time difference from the UK to Phoenix was eight hours. So the jet lag was a real pain. So 6pm in Phoenix was 2am in the UK. So my evenings were pretty written off as I was asleep early most nights. I get terrible jet lag anyway, and we can't buy melatonin tablets here. Melatonin is not allowed. So I didn't have any with me and I didn't get any for a few days. But I like being up early. So I woke up around 3am most mornings and got some writing done before going for a walk and then going to the conference. I managed to almost finish How to Write a Novel, my next non-fiction book, in the hours before the conference even started each morning. When I finally did get some melatonin as I made my pilgrimage to Walgreens, I also bought one of your huge packs of 200 Advil. This is another difference. Here in the UK, if you want painkillers, you can only buy really basic painkillers in packs of 16 or maybe 24. And if you want something stronger, you have to go see a pharmacist or a doctor. And for us, something stronger is what some Americans pop before breakfast. So yes, when I visit, I always make a trip to Walgreens or another big drugstore. They are a cornucopia of medical delights that we mostly can't access here easily without a prescription. There are pros and cons to both approaches, of course. So I took my melatonin when I got back to the UK and it helped a lot with the reverse jet lag. So I was happy to get some at last. Visiting the Desert Botanical Gardens in Phoenix and a day trip to Sedona. So I love the desert landscape of Arizona and visited back in the mid 90s when my mum lived in San Diego and I came over for a visit and we went to the Grand Canyon and Sedona back then. We also visited the biosphere between Phoenix and Tucson and the memory of that visit sticks with me to this day and I brought it to life in the climax of my thriller Stone of Fire which is basically set there and you couldn't really get an area more different to Bath where I live now in terms of climate, landscape and culture. So I arrived a few days before the conference so I could have some desert time. I visited the Desert Botanical Gardens in Phoenix, which is highly recommended if you love desert plants and cacti in particular. Many were in flower and there were hummingbirds sipping at the nectar. And we don't have hummingbirds here in the UK except in the zoos. So it was very exotic as I walked through the gardens in the heat of the day. It was definitely too hot for me, like the hottest days in a UK summer heat wave. Not that hot for people who live there, of course, but I should have gone earlier in the day and I had to take a break halfway through and sip an icy cold drink in the shade to cool down for a bit. Now, I wanted to see the saguaro cacti in particular, uh, and many of them stand on a hillside in one part of the park. There was also an exhibition of Chihuly glass sculptures echoing the lines of the cacti in different places. And I'll be putting pictures in the show notes of this episode uh, so you can look at that. Definitely recommended if you visit Phoenix. The next day, I did a day trip to Sedona with Detours American West, which picked up and returned at a nearby resort. It was a well-organised trip, and the driver, guide, same person, was friendly and helpful, stopping regularly enough for comfort breaks, which is always good on a long drive, and made the day a good one. I would definitely travel with them again. We started out at the Chapel of the Holy Cross, which is super dramatic landscape there, then visited Bell Rock, then a viewpoint with dramatic scenes of the Red Rock valleys and formations. I love the Red Rock landscape. Something about it resonates deep in my soul. And I felt the same way in the red interior of Australia, in the Northern Territory in particular. That that terracotta colour is my favourite. We had a few hours free in Sedona Village, which is both super touristy and full of tacky gifts, but also laid back with good eating options and great views if you find the right place to sit, which you definitely should. I had a glass of chilled rosé with a lot of water and tacos overlooking the red rocks. And if you go, definitely make sure you have a view with your lunch or your coffee. And on the way back, we stopped at Montezuma's Castle, which is nothing to do with Montezuma and is not a castle. (laughs) It's actually a simple Native American cliff dwelling from the Sinagua people, built between the 12th and 15th centuries. Now, visiting there with a bus full of Americans who were super impressed with this made me realise another big difference between our cultures. 
So the UK and Europe are full of historical sites on a much grander scale. Perhaps we take them for granted, as they are seriously everywhere. Um, the Roman baths near where I live were built 60 years before Christ, 12 centuries before that cliff dwelling in Arizona. And the abbey was established in the 7th century and the city developed. Obviously, we have the Georgian architecture that you see in Bridgerton and all of this. We consider ancient sites to be more like Stonehenge, which was built 5,000 years ago rather than 500 And this is one of the reasons we moved back to England from Australia in 2011. I missed the rich historical, religious and cultural places, the architecture, the museums that we almost trip over here in the UK. And I felt that same, I guess, missing, that sense of something missing in Arizona. Now, I love to visit the desert, absolutely. But I need the human element, which results in architectural wonder, the culture, religion. For all our faults, we humans can create great beauty. So in terms of climate, Arizona is incredibly dry and it's easy to dehydrate. I drank lots of water, but I found my skin dried out, even my eyeballs (laughs) and my nasal passages. Uh, And I used moisturiser and eye drops and nasal spray and Vaseline up my nose. I mean, seriously, you have to like stick a glob of Vaseline up your nose twice a day. But even so, it's a super dry climate. So yes, drink lots of water, even if sitting still. Other things I'd forgotten about the USA. The prices of items in a store are always confusing. So here in the UK, the price quoted is the price that includes taxes. And tipping is for great service, not a necessity. In the USA, the price is quoted without taxes. So if something is $5.99, you actually need more than $6 to pay for it. Plus, you need to tip everywhere, which also adds to the price. So it feels a lot more expensive and kind of out of control because you never know how much you're spending. Uh, And if you're paying cash, it's really confusing. (laughs) Also, if you're paying by card, the server walks away with it and processes it somewhere else. This does not happen in the UK. Um, And if it does, we will run after it as they might be skimming. Um, We keep hold of the card and it's processed at the table with handheld devices within your view. I actually use my Apple Watch to pay most of the time now, even in a restaurant as they bring the device to the table. I hate seeing a server walk away with my card in the USA. Makes me so nervous. The food is different here too, obviously. Part of that is the sheer amount of it, both the portion sizes, but also the amount of choice in the USA. So I went to this eggs place for breakfast and the menu was several pages of variations on breakfast. Although amusingly, they didn't have my favourite brunch, which is scrambled eggs and smoked salmon. Um, Very common here. I'm sure it's common in other places in the USA, but they didn't have it at this eggs place in Arizona. And also on portion size, we generally drink European sized coffee in what I'm Americans consider tiny, tiny cups. (laughs) Also, I mean, I get if you go for brunch here and you want eggs, there'll be maybe three options sort of, you know, full breakfast, eggs and bacon and sausage and beans and things. And then there might be scrambled eggs with salmon or bacon. And uh, then that might be it, (laughs) basically. So this was literally four pages of options. So the food is also a lot sweeter in the US. There is seems to be sugar in everything, even unexpected things like bacon. Seriously, I was like, please, can I have bacon without sugar? And they're like, oh, well, it's maple bacon. <laughs> you don't need maple in your bacon. It's good on its own. Now, it is hard to find food with no sugar in general, especially as a tourist with no car. Of course, I understand that you have amazing food in the USA. And if you have a car and you can shop at Whole Foods or local markets or there's incredible produce in the USA, I realise this. But if you don't have a car and you're a tourist, it's actually quite hard to find. (laughs) It's hard to find simple food with no sugar. My stomach is pretty much always upset when I come to the USA. In fact, once I was so sick in Savannah one time, I had to leave because I was eating that. I tried some of that rich southern cuisine and I had to go home and then fly back to the UK. I was so sick and so miserable, which is kind of funny in a way because uh, people worry about getting a stomach upset in places like India. But I cycled through southwest India for several weeks and I put on five kilos (laughs) because the food was so delicious and I never had any problems it's it's about what you're used to I guess and uh, you know the different places affect us in different ways 
But yes, I absolutely don't comment and say, but we have amazing food. You do have amazing food. But um, if you're a tourist and you don't have a car, it can be quite hard to get to. Also, in the UK, you won't need to ask for a box to go at the end of your meal. Firstly, because our portion sizes are a lot smaller, so you should actually finish your meal. And secondly, it's considered rude. (laughs) Perhaps that's changing now because more Americans are expecting it. But certainly I've been brought up to consider it seriously rude to ask for a doggy bag or for some of your food to go. So I always find that weird in restaurants where they say, do you want this to go? And you're like, no, that's just rude. Uh, So other differences. The water was so soft in Arizona and my hair was just lovely. Just felt so soft and lovely after washing. Here in Bath, in the southwest of England, we have to use fabric softener for our clothes, lots of conditioner for our hair, and my hair never feels like it did in Arizona. And there's lime scale in the kettle, which you have to clean out. And yes, we could get a water filter, whatever, but there's benefits to lime scale, (laughs) I'm sure. Also, on a difficult topic but I'm going to bring it up anyway. While I was there the Roe versus Wade discussion started once more after a leak from the Supreme Court and it brought up this other distinction between our cultures. We have plenty of people of faith in the UK but we don't have overt religious discussions in the media or in government, certainly in England at least and probably in Wales and Scotland. Northern Ireland is obviously different, but in England at least, abortion is about health. Religion is completely separate. And so I find the discussion with religious, there's just so much more religious discussion in the public eye in the US that we just don't have in England. It's just considered a completely separate thing from the government. Huge American flags also puzzle me. There was a massive one on the hill above the resort, the biggest one I've ever seen. It was bigger than some of these really big cars. So very few British people would ever fly a Union Jack, even if they consider themselves patriotic. However, I am actually recording this over the Queen, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee weekend here in the UK, her 70 year jubilee. And there are actually Union Jacks everywhere. (laughs) So it's funny as I record this, there are Union Jacks everywhere, but they will all be gone pretty quickly. We don't really do a lot of flag waving. So also, although I'm comfortable in the USA and I'm confident there, people comment on my accent all the time, which is lovely. And I'm happy that people like it. I I enjoy that. But it's also a reminder that I am other, other with a capital O. And I actually like that feeling when I'm traveling. I like to be other. I like to question things. I like to ask questions that I'm allowed to ask because I'm clearly not from that area. And I usually find this feeling of being other is a lot more intense when the language spoken is not English and I can't understand the signs or conversation. But this time in the US, I really felt that otherness. And I like that. I really like that. It's definitely one of the reasons I travel. I like feeling like like an outsider. So here in the UK, we have a class system and a hierarchy of accents. You might not be able to tell my class from my accent, um, but it's got nothing to do with money either. You can have a really posh accent and no money. Uh, You can have a very regional accent and have loads of money. It's very different class hierarchy, class hierarchy to income hierarchy, although there might be some commonalities. But we have hierarchies of everything here. So for example, my husband, (laughs) Jonathan, when uh, he first moved to the UK with me and he bought me this box of chocolates, uh, Black Magic. And if you're British, you'll know you don't buy a box of Black Magic for the one you love. Black Magic. And also now, maybe in the 80s, but now Black Magic, you just don't do that. In the class class hierarchy of boxes of chocolates, Black Magic is not the one. (laughs) And he was like, well, how am I meant to know that? (laughs) I said, well, you just know. This is just an English thing. We have hierarchies of everything. And that is definitely less of an issue in the USA, or at least it seems that way. You have inequality, absolutely, but you seem to have less hierarchy. Communication styles are different too. We rely a lot on subtext here in the UK. We might say something and mean something completely different, like, I'd love to catch up sometime, might actually mean, I never want to see you again. 
It depends on the context, the body language and other things which we can't explain. Americans are much more direct and overtly cheerful. I have to amp up my smile wattage when I visit the USA. We tend to avoid random conversations in England, so we might seem unfriendly, but we are nice if you get past our initial reserve, I promise. It's also fun to hang out with American friends and find we have very different frames of reference. For example, they talk about people I have never heard of who are famous in the USA or TV shows or scandals or news that we just haven't heard here in the UK. And vice versa, of course, every country will have the things that are important to them. But it feels like the pandemic really narrowed our vision so much and our own country situation looms so large. We forget this perspective that we are just tiny specks living pretty much insignificant lives on the face of the earth for a blink of an eye. And I love that shift of perspective. It's one of the reasons I travel. I want to feel insignificant and it helps me live more fully knowing that memento mori, remember you will die. So get on with living. So in conclusion, it was good to be back out in what was more of a normal business travel experience with a few great extra days of exploring aspects of the desert. I'll be back in the USA soon, Las Vegas in November, Colorado Springs in February. And by the end of those trips, I expect the USA will feel normal again. So I'm really interested in your thoughts. Uh, What do you think are some of the differences between the cultures? And if you're an American who's visited the UK, what stands out for you and vice versa? Please leave a comment uh, on booksandtravel.page forward slash listen. You can find the episodes there. You can tweet me at The Creative Pen, leave a comment on the YouTube channel, and I would love to hear from you. So happy travels until next time. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.